Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, a state assembly member from Brooklyn will talk transportation, Albany, politics, and drama. The president of the Brooklyn Young Republicans and a weekend roundup. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Brian Vines filling in for Ashley Ford. Happy to be here again. It is Black History Month, but why February? Is it because it's the coldest month? Is it because it's the shortest month? Is it because it's the birthday of Langston Hughes, the man who asked, what happens to a dream deferred? And I paraphrase, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Actually, according to the record books, it was initiated in 1926 as Negro History Week by historian, scholar, educator, and publisher Carter G. Woodson. Fifty years later, it was extended to become a month-long celebration. Now, Woodson had chosen the second week in February because it encompassed Frederick Douglass's birthday on February 14th and Abe Lincoln's on February 12th. Presidents have issued national decrees commemorating the month since the 70s. And famously, last year, 45 issued a kind of rhetorical resurrection. Remember? Frederick Douglass is an example of someone who's done an amazing job, unquote. Indeed he has, sir. Indeed he has. Today, we're visited by Robert Carroll, a first-term state assembly member representing Brooklyn's 44th district, to talk about transportation and the scene in Albany. And we've got what may strike some as an unexpected conversation with the president of the Brooklyn Young Republicans. Yes, such a thing does exist, and he'll be here. But first, these things. Oh, Gowanus, you tempt us with your potential and you repulse us with your pollution. But we thought we were on a winning path. Superfund spilling in, sludge coming out, condos rising along with rents. But hey, we'll get some waterfront park in exchange, right? But not so fast, according to the Brooklyn paper. The cleanup has hit a snag. The process of installing bulkheads along the banks has created cracks and fissures in the surrounding land and buildings. Now, what this means is the cleanup crews are reassessing their methods, using smaller equipment, and pushing back the date when they can dredge and cap the contaminated canal below in the bed. Well, let's just hope the construction cranes rise again before the waters do. Next, a number, 1,785. That's how many health violations there were last year in Brooklyn public school cafeterias. Among the critical violations, mice, roaches, and unsafe food temperatures. Those are most harmful to children's health. According to Brooklyner.com, six Brooklyn schools racked up five critical violations, including PS249 in Flatbush Ditmas Park. The list is refrigerated food above 41 degrees, Mice, rats, mice again, and roaches. I guess the old adage holds. No such thing as a rodent-free lunch, at least in those schools. And now this uplifting story. A Brooklyn building superintendent, originally from Kosovo, is making his way to the Olympics this month as an alternate on his home country's ski racing team. He fled Kosovo during the Civil War as a teen. He honed his ski chops in the Poconos and picked up racing just last year. But he built a training apparatus in the bowels of his Dumbo building and spends hours each day shushing back and forth. And now he's headed to Korea. We'll be right back with the assembly member. <laughs> If you just landed on Earth from Mars, you'd probably never guess there was much of a difference between government and theater. Yes, Mr. Shakespeare, not only is the world a stage, but so is our body politic. Our next guest seems to appreciate this well. He is both a politician and a playwright, the first foremost, as he represents Brooklyn's 44th in the State Assembly. He's here to talk about transportation, 
Albany, and maybe a little bit about his politics-inspired play. Robert Carroll, welcome to 112BK. Thank you so much, Brian. It's great to be here. Thanks. So the 44th I mentioned is one of the most diverse districts in the state, definitely in Brooklyn. So I'm wondering, from your opinion, who do you think your constituents are? Well, I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's one of the most diverse districts in Brooklyn, which is one of the most diverse counties in the country. So, um, you know, I represent Park Slope, Windsor Terrace, Kensington, a little bit of Borough Park, as well as a little bit of Ditmas Park in Midwood. So, um, you know, we have Orthodox Jewish population, we have a Bengali and Pakistani population, we have folks from Nepal and Russia and Poland, we have old Irish and Italian and Puerto Rican families, and of course we have all the new people who've come into Brooklyn uh, over the last 20 years. Right. So it's a, it's a great place, it's a place that I grew up, it's a great place to represent because, you know, you can go from one moment to being at a mosque and working with new immigrants and the struggles that are there to, you know, going to an old community association that's populated by people who've lived in the neighborhood for generations. So how do you engage all of those different levels of your constituency? So, I mean, one of my favorite things to do is go out and meet people where they are. So, you know, every week we try to go and do a subway and talk yeah. to people as they go to work. Uh, we try to make sure that we hit all the different shopping strips or places of worship because you really can't represent anyone if you don't talk to them. Mm -hmm. And that's the big part of this job is going out and talking to folks and seeing where they stand and what's affecting them. Because I can get an idea of that, um, but I won't really know that unless I talk to people. So how many of those people that you talk to say, What's the state assembly? If I have a pothole, I can call 311. If this is happening, I call these guys. What do you guys do? Well, exactly. Way too many people. Um, so the simple answer I give them is, you know what Congress is, right? So the state assembly is Congress just for New York. And so there's 150 of us from all over New York. We come together in Albany. And we're the main lawmaking body for the state. So most of the laws that affect you from your housing laws, to the MTA, to the criminal code, to banking laws, they're all done up in Albany. And it's really important. It's sometimes it seems like it's a faraway place and it may seem a little antiquated and complicated, yeah. but it's gonna affect your daily life maybe more than any form of government there is. So Albany does seem like this faraway tundra when you're sitting here downstate in New York City. And it may seem a little removed for folks. And the news that we get is always about scandal or gridlock or something in Albany. So I'm just wondering from your perspective as the new guy, how do you distinguish yourself and serve your constituents in a place that's often represented to us as just not great? Yeah, and look, there, and there are not great parts of it. And there is gridlock and there's a real inertia that is built up over time of not doing certain things or this is the way it's done and we're not going to change. And I think there's a bunch of new members from Brooklyn and from all over the state who are trying to change that. Um, and of course, you know, the newspapers and TV, when there is a scandal, that, that sells a lot more newspapers. That's a lot sexier than talking about, you know, the capital budget of the MTA or talking about uh, how we're going to fix our criminal justice system, because those are really difficult questions, and you have to actually think about it for a while. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, my hope is that I think since I was elected, there's so many people in my district and around New York City who seem to be more engaged, that we can take that engagement that's focused on the national level, and we can take a little bit of it and focus it on Albany and say, how can we fix our state government? Because, you know, it's not just Washington that's broken, it is Albany that's broken. There's a whole host of laws yeah. that if we got better people, I think we would change them and more people would be uh, receptive to that kind of government. So we watched the president give his State of the Union address the other night and saw the House divided, literally. And we know you and your 149 colleagues are working on one side, but there's some aisle crossing in the other part of yeah. the body. And I'm talking about the IDC, where there's some Democrats who break off and they vote with the Republicans there. I wondered how that is and working across the aisle in the assembly and how you guys look at folks like the IDC on the other side. I mean, it's really frustrating, right? Because, you know, one of the big things that folks do when they go into the ballot box, they're busy and they see a, de a D next to somebody's name and they kind of assume certain things, right. for better or for worse. And, you know, a big thing that I do is that when you know that you're going to elect me, you know I'm going to work in the assembly majority, which is the Democratic conference. Now, it doesn't mean that I agree with everybody in the Democratic conference, and it doesn't mean that we always have the right ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think it's disingenuous to go out uh, and tell the folks that you represent that you're going to be a Democrat 
and then at the same exact time, you go up and you empower a Republican minority. You know, there are 32 elected Democrats, there's 31 elected Republicans. They give cover uh, to a Republican minority in the state Senate that is very suburban and rural, um, that really doesn't have, I think, the needs of New York City uh, in, their, in their interest. And the, the unfortunate part, part is that most of these members of the IDC represent New York City. Um, and there's one who represents Brooklyn. And it's, it's, it's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's craven. And that's why people, I think, don't like politicians, is because they say, you know what, this guy or this woman yeah. is out for themselves. Right. And they're doing what's best for them. They're not doing what's best for people. And that kind of solidifies that viewpoint when people find out about the IDC. And I think that's why people are so angry at them. So at the beginning of that answer, you said people might be busy. They go into the ballot little area voting booth and see a D next to someone's name and they make certain assumptions. I wonder what you think those assumptions that they are making are. Well, I think in New York City, I mean, I think the first is that, okay, they kind of get that there are two caucuses. There's a Republican caucus and there's a Democratic caucus. And so they kind of assume, okay, you're going to be with the Democrats. I think in New York City, I mean, that means, you know, we care about a woman's right to choose. Mm -hmm. We care about the DREAM Act. We care about making sure that $15 minimum wage is there. We care about working people. We care about our public schools. Uh, and that's not to say that, look, Republicans don't care about those things, but I think they go about how they care about those things in a totally different way, right? I think Democrats go and say, look, government is a way, is a force for good, and we can even out the scales a little bit, and that people don't all start at the same position, and we need to figure out how we can, people who have less than, people who aren't as well off, have a leg up sometimes, where I think my uh, colleagues in the Republican Party often say, let's be laissez-faire. Let everyone just figure it out for themselves. Less government is better, mm -hmm. and that's how society should figure itself out. And I just don't agree with that. And I would say that at least that's what I think of when I go into the in the ballot box. C a D versus <laughs> an R. So let's get on the transportation train. Is congestion pricing coming to New York City? I hope so. Uh, now look, the Assembly and the State Senate are going to have a big role to play there. Um, but I think the broad strokes of a congestion pricing plan, they've worked in London. London's a city very similar to New York, similar size. It's worked in Stockholm, which its main central business district is an island like Manhattan. Uh, it's worked in Singapore and Milan. Um, I think we need to have a direct revenue stream that's mm -hmm. constant. The MTA doesn't currently have that because it doesn't have an ability to tax people the way the city and the state can do. Right. Um, it's going to need about $20 billion in its next capital program to upgrade signals and switches, upgrade cars, do a whole host of things to make your commute and my commute better. Uh, in Paris, uh, the newest subway line, the trains come every 85 seconds. If we have a modernized signaling system, we might not come every 85 seconds in New York, but we can come every two to three minutes. Right. And that's a lot better for folks who ride the G train, the F train, the B, the Q, all which intersect my district. Yeah. And that's really important. And now people are going to get frustrated because nobody likes to pay for something that used to be free. Yeah. Um, but I think we all have to take responsibility. And if we don't do something now, mm -hmm. the unfortunate thing is the subway service is only going to get worse and worse and worse, which is going to hurt all of us, not just our livelihoods, but our quality of life. Yeah. And congestion pricing, if we're serious about being green, congestion pricing should reduce greenhouse gases from cars by 20 percent, should reduce traffic in the city by 20 percent. Those are all like you're voting yes. I'm voting yes, yes. I, I am a, I've, I've been a clear yes. Um, and now look, the devil is in the details. I'm not saying that they're, you know, everything that the governor's proposals come out is, is perfect right. um, or other proposals that have come out in the past. But I think the big concept, um, I think if you're a serious individual and you're serious about New York City being the best for all of us, yeah. I think it's the way to go. So short answer then, would you support something like uh, control in the city of the MTA to wrestle it away from Albany? Yeah, I mean, state? I mean, look, right, that's the big debate between the mayor and the governor yeah. right now, that the trend... You know, the transit authority technically still owns the train, which is run by the city, but the MTA, which actually has all the control, is run by the state. Um, you know, the metro area is a big, big place. It's got 25 million people, uh, and we have 12 counties in New York, plus northern New Jersey and southern Connecticut. And so I understand why there could be a regional transportation network might be right. a good idea. But I think if the state is not going to allow uh, mm -hmm. the residents of the city and the city itself to find a way for a, a well-maintained and well-functioning and well-financed system, then, yeah, we've got to wrestle it away. Um, so we've got 
literally one minute left. <laughs> you wrote a play. You helped uh, to keep a nonprofit theater company running. You're a lawyer by trade, yeah. and you are also a legislator. Do you fear falling into the trap of the career politician? <laughs> you know, no. I mean, I love I love my job right now. It's a great, great job. Uh, you know, before I was in the legislature, I was a lawyer, and before that. I was a theater major in college, and I did a bunch of acting after college, and I wrote a play that got produced, and I still love that. And I think if you're going to actually go represent folks, having a multitude of interests, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, right, I, I wouldn't want to be some guy who's thought of as like a career bureaucrat um, and some middle manager almost who's up there in Albany. Uh, and look, and that's why I love Brooklyn, right? You can do so many different things in Brooklyn, go to so many interesting things, and I keep trying to do that. And I'm a young guy, and I'm a single guy, so it allows me to do that, so hopefully I won't. <laughs> All right, well, we'll leave it there, and we'll definitely be watching. Fantastic. Robert Carroll from Brooklyn's 44th, thanks for joining us on 112BK. Thank you, Brian. Let's face it, in Brooklyn, we live in a bubble. We're trying to burst it a bit over here, exposing ourselves and our audience to diverse viewpoints. How diverse? Well, as we've noted before, Brooklyn doesn't exactly vote Republican. Fewer than 20% in the borough voted for Trump in 2016. But now that he's been in office for a year, we're trying to hear from that rare breed. Not that all necessarily voted for Trump, but those who still associate with his party. How are they feeling about his first year, the polarization, the state of politics in the borough and America? And what better person to ask than Brandon Washington, president of the Brooklyn Young Republicans. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Brian. Brooklyn Young Republicans. So when we first met a few years ago, I'm going to quote you to you now. You said, oh boy. you can be a part of the Republican Party, black and not a sellout. And you continue to be an example of that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, when a lot of people ask me, well, why did you become a Republican? Uh, I always tell my members, if you're going to be civically involved, mm -hmm. try to choose a party that best reflects your values. Now, for me, I care about school choice. I care about low-income families having more options as to where they send their kids to school. I want to see more black families own their own homes. I want to see more young millennial entrepreneurship entrepreneurs have their own businesses. Mm -hmm. These are the values that I care about, and these are the values that I believe the Republican Party cares about as well. So when asked about, well, why did you become a Republican, it was really more of a, uh, a policy-based decision, you know, that reflected the things that I care about for my people, as opposed to anything else. Not a particular person. I certainly didn't do it for the political expediency, because as you said, you know, <laughs> we're in deep blue, you know, Brooklyn, you know, so I'm a Republican, you know, so I, it's not... You know, there's a, there's a lot of backlash that you get right. from being in, in this particular party, but I always say stand up for what you believe in, stand up for your values no matter what. Okay, so those values, let's look at school choice through the lens of a Brooklynite right now. Mm. And we often find ourselves, particularly in communities of color, on the short end of the deal when it comes oh, yeah. to school choice. Oh, yeah. So how do you square that sort of nationalist DeVos ethos with what actually happens in the neighborhoods of Brooklyn? Right, well, you know, I'm gonna tell you like this. Uh, with my club, I always tell them, listen, we need to focus on an authentic grassroots effort, especially involving education, mm -hmm. because knowledge is power. And you see a lot of people within a black community that are relatively powerless in compared to white upper-class Americans. Right. And I don't think that that's right. And I think that that's where a lot of the division is coming from. Now, over the past couple of years, I've worked in conjunction with some of the black churches to promote school choice. Mm -hmm. Back in April of 2017, I've even went as far as to, you know, organize an event where we got low-income parents uh, more options on where they're sending their kids to school. We actually helped their kids find yeah. charter schools in the area. So we are making a difference. We are making an impact. Uh, even without, you know, the vast amount of resources, yeah. we are visible. Do you need to be a Republican to do that? Do what exactly? To mobilize people to have grassroots action. Is that, uh, <laughs> is that a, I almost said gendered, is that a, a party affiliated thing to do? Well, you know, I, one thing about the Democrats that I do give them credit for is that they are experts when it comes down to monopolizing grassroots efforts. And that's an area that a lot of Republicans lack in. 
You know, so when I took office a couple of years ago, actually three years ago, I said, hey, listen, as opposed to us just sitting here talking about the things that we're against, mm -hmm. everyone knows that stuff already. Let's actually mobilize, let's galvanize people, not just Republicans, but independents, open-minded Democrats and progressives, and let's address these issues that are affecting our community. And that's what we've been doing. So how do you think the Democrats then would stand in the doorway from you accomplishing those goals that you see in the Republican Party? You know, I... I your grassroots organizing right. that they're monopolizing. Right. You know, I, I don't look at this as me infringing on their turf mm -hmm. because I am... I grew up in Brooklyn. You know, this is my home. Many of my family members and friends live here. Right. So what affects my people ultimately affects me. Yeah. This is a personal issue. So, yes, I've taken backlash from Democratic leaders. I'm not going to call no names. You know, who look at this as a turf war. And I'm like, listen, this isn't about, you know, uh, partisanship. You know, this is about doing what we can to help everyday people progress. If you're truly for progression, yeah. let's work together. Do you feel that the president, with his address the other night and just the way that he's handling himself in his administration, is speaking to you as his base? Because mm. there's a lot of dog whistles and you see him sort of leading by rallying, like he's still in campaign mode, some would say, but a lot of that's not directed at Republicans who maybe look or think or even act like you do. Uh, well, you know, the interesting thing about President Trump, uh, and I will give him credit for this, hmm. he wasn't my first choice, Yeah. but I was very, very impressed with the State of the Union address. Yeah. I have been impressed with some of the concerted efforts that he have been doing, that he has been doing yeah. over the past year or so to reach out to the black community. I mean, as he stated, and these are based off of facts and statistics by yeah. the Department of Labor, black unemployment is at an all-time low. But what I will say is that even though that's a step in the right direction— And an Obama-era hangover, many would say. Right. But even though that is a step in the right direction, black unemployment, it's not enough, because you still have a lot of people of color work in retails, they're working in fast food restaurants, they're working low wage jobs. Right. And it's, you know, if I go to McDonald's, for example, and I order a Big Mac and I see the manager, for example, or the owner, you know, he's white, that's great, you know, kudos to you for being successful. Yeah. But I see my brothers and sisters pretty much, you know, on a cashier register, I, I do feel some type of way. I'm like, well, you know, we need more black business owners. You know, we need more colored people, you know, in positions of influence and power. Do you think Trump feels the same way? You know, I don't know him personally, so I can't say that. If you're asking me... Well, uh, based on what we know of his policies and right. his tweets and his rhetoric. Right. You know, one thing about rhetoric is that uh, it can be perceived one way, uh, but the person could be a totally different individual. I mean, I'm not here I'm not here to defend Trump's rhetoric. In fact, I take issues with a lot of the stupid things that he posts on Twitter. Yeah. You know, I will be honest about that. Uh, but if, if you're asking me whether or not I think that the man is a racist or whatnot, I mean, I don't know. I don't know his heart. Yes. What I look at, what I look at the policy. <laughs> well, I mean, you can say that. I just look at policies. Well, he said it when he says that people are, there's some good people on both sides. Mm. Aligning himself with the racist, we know. Okay, well, how give me an example. About the Haitian and okay, so, African country. Right now, let me let me tell you something about that. Um, There's no now my my district, that. my community. It's Canarsie, yeah. as you know, and it's predominantly Haitian. Right. Uh, so I have a lot of Haitian friends in that neighborhood, and let me tell you something. I have not met not one Haitian who have said, "Man." I would love to go back to Hades and raise my family over there. It's such a great place to live. No, people have come here by the thousands yeah. to America yeah. to seek a better life. And one other thing about Donald Trump that but I will this add. This is not like a Jesse Jackson, I was born in the ghetto, the ghetto wasn't born in me. Right. By his line of following, if you come from a shithole, you're probably shit. Right, but here's the thing, here's the thing. This is one thing that I will add. When it comes down to those comments, mm -hmm. and you know, you being a professional journalist, you out of all people know this above anyone else, and mm -hmm. I have enormous amount of respect for you, everything has to be based off of objectivity. Now, from an objective perspective, mm -hmm. there is no audio evidence to suggest that he actually said that. So I can't get on the bandwagon and condemn him for comments that are confirmed but not or denied. not confirmed. Not denied either, but yeah. you do have people who were there in that office who have denied it. Sure. So I wasn't there. I can't, I can't make those comments about it. I can't criticize them for it. Fair enough. 
So is your guy gonna, uh, number one, I'm calling him your guy. My guy, look He's at you, president. my guy. So I'm reeling <laughs> it back in. I feel very comfortable with you, Brandon. Likewise. But I'm saying, would you vote for him again if you in fact did the first Well, you time? know what, let me go on the record and say that I didn't vote for him the first time. Okay. Yeah, uh, would I sense. vote for him again? I would vote for, I would work, I would vote for an incumbent or a candidate. Uh, okay, let's say an incumbent because he is the president. I yeah. would vote for an incumbent based off of uh, their experience and their progress in office and things that they've accomplished in office. Maybe more to the point, what would he have to do to lose your vote? What would he have to do if I see a lack of leadership? Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my issues Check. with right <laughs> one of one of my issues with the Republican Party, and I'm not the only black conservative who have felt this way, is that over the past few decades, there has not really been a concerted effort to mm -hmm. reach out to minority communities. Yeah. Now, with Donald Trump, for example, again, I'm not on the Trump bandwagon, but what I will say is that he has made efforts to reach out to to the NAACP and to other black organizations and black churches, and that I will give him credit for. If I see progress mm -hmm. in these areas, in these communities, then yes, I will vote for him. I will say that, I will vote for him. Okay. Because I'm, I'm in the business of the interest of our people. You know, not any particular candidate or incumbent. All right, you're a deal maker. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, Brandon Washington, president of the Brooklyn Young Republicans. Thanks for joining us on Ryan, thank TV you for having me. And now, our inaugural installment of a weekly Weekend Roundup. As I mentioned at the top, it is Black History Month all month, and accordingly, BAM has curated a festival featuring an alternative cinematic history of black screen heroes. It begins February 2nd and will feature Shaft, of course, Foxy Brown, Black Dynamite, The Meteor Man, and Ghost Dog. All right, get to BAM. On February 3rd, you can eat some foo-foo with your friends after you dance to the rhythms of Afrobeat, soul, reggae, and hip-hop at the Afro Soul Afrobeat Brooklyn, first Saturdays at Buka at 946 Fulton Street, and the doors open at 10 p.m. At Brooklyn Steel on February 2nd, the garage rock band Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, as of taping, tickets were still available. And just opened at Theater for a New Audience on Ashland, the wrenching play by Adrian Kennedy. He brought her heart back in a box. The Times calls it a beautiful nightmare. It's about a couple telling their stories of a romance lived in a racially divided town. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great weekend. We'll be right back next week to talk about the nightmare. No, not the nightmare, but the nightmare. One of Brooklyn's 30 Under 30, more on policing, and Frederick Douglass. Wait, it's not Frederick Douglass. He's dead. It's his great, great grandson, and we're looking forward to that and hope that you can join us. Bye now.